Hello everyone. Today we're going to look at open theism. My goal here is to analyze open theism on its own terms. Now of course I come from the reformed view of scripture and I hold to reformed doctrines. Personally I affirm the 1689 London Baptist Confession. What I'm trying to do in this analysis is not assume that my perspective is correct, but to look at open theism within itself and analyze its own position within itself. And in doing that, I am clearly not going to hit on everyone's, every open theist's favorite flavor of open theism or dynamic omniscience. Already you can tell because I say also known as dynamic omniscience at the top there that this is going to be probably more of a John Sanders flavor of open theism. And if that's not your flavor of open theism, uh, I am not attempting to exclude your view. I'm looking at what I have learned by interacting and listening to open theists thus far in my experience on social media. And this covers probably about the last year of such interactions and investigations. This is not going to be a super long video, Lord willing, but um, it is going to analyze some of the most important points as I understand them to be. So there's no attempt here to be discourteous to anyone who subscribes to open theism or to be exclusionary of anybody within that camp you know, on purpose. I just didn't want to interact with that idea or this idea over here. It's the main ideas that I have uh, learned about over the course of the last year or so. All right, so let's just dive right in here following along this outline. So what is open theism or dynamic omniscience? It's the idea that God is open to us, that he responds to creatures, that he is affected by things that his creatures do. And also with that is that the future is known to God, but only as possibilities but not with certainty as to which of these possibilities will be actualized by creatures. This also requires affirming three concepts. The first one is that God is omniscient. God knows all that is logically possible to know. God doesn't know false things or contradictions as true. For example, he doesn't know married bachelors as a true thing, doesn't know squared circles as a true thing. He knows that those those contradictory concepts exist, but he doesn't know those contradictory concepts as true. <clears throat> the second thing that an open theist needs to um, affirm is presentism. Now, only the present exists in presentism. And the whole discussion around presentism is about what really <laughs> actually exists. And so presentists will say it is only now, only, only the present is real. And a proof text, or a supporting text, I should say, that open theists will use is Revelation 1.8, where God speaks of himself in tense terms, saying that he is the one who is, and who was, and who is to come. And number three, at least at some point in the past, God had to be free to either create or to not create. When talking about open theism, we need to also understand necessity. A settled future means that events must happen, meaning that these events are necessary. Open theists except that God determines some things. For example, in Acts 4, we find that Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, did whatever God's hand had, his plan had predestined to take place. Open theists will 
readily accept that as true because it says so in scripture. Open theists reject that all future events are necessary and thus the future is not completely settled. And they also affirm that God has the freedom to decide which future individuals and events are necessary and which remain possible. All creation is his, he can do as he likes with it. And that's what open theists will readily acknowledge. When analyzing propositions about the future, there are three views. One, all future propositions are either true or false. All future propositions are false. Or three, all future propositions are neither true nor false, as if that's not even the right question to ask. Okay, so um, let's look at a, an example of, I will have eggs for breakfast tomorrow. That proposition could be true or could be false. Now we have to keep in mind, if that proposition is true, then it is necessary that I will have, I will actually eat eggs for breakfast tomorrow. If that proposition is false, it is necessary that I do not eat eggs for breakfast tomorrow. And again, so we just saw in number two, if it's false, then it's necessary that I don't eat eggs tomorrow. And then if that proposition is neither true nor false, well, we're not really looking at the right question. Perhaps a better question would be, is it possible that I will have eggs for breakfast tomorrow? Okay, so let's look at some, some problems that arise from what open theism is. Just We're just at the 10,000 foot level looking down here, or maybe even 30,000 foot level looking down here at what this is. These are some key concepts though within it. So the first problem is presentism. God is held to presentism in the dynamic omniscience open theist view. How can eternity exist in presentism? The scriptural testimony shows us that God inhabits eternity in Isaiah 57, 15. In 2 Peter 3, 8, we find that for God, one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years is one day. It is also unclear how the wording who is and who was and who is to come affirms presentism merely because these are tensed terms. Then also there is the argument that open theists will make about being God being trapped by fate. In opposition to the concept of God's decree as affirmed by the Westminster Confession of Faith and the 1689 London Baptist Confession, where God has decreed all that sh shall come to pass, and that he decided this completely within and of himself, not from anything outside of himself. In opposition to that, open theists will say that God would be trapped into doing what he decided to do in that case. What's interesting about that objection is, this objection is not raised by open theists when they recognize that God affirms that scripture shows he does predestine some things. So the question then is, what makes the decision by God to act become something that God is trapped by? So God decides that he will do such and such thing several thousand years into the future. What is it that makes God trapped by that decision to do that thing? Is it the passage of time? And if that's so, how much time must pass for God to suddenly become trapped by that decision? And then two, you know, secondly, wasn't God free to choose to do that thing? For instance, if we go back to Acts 4, where it is granted that God predestined by his own plan that Herod and Pontius Pilate and the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel would do the things that God had planned to do 
within the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. If God was free to choose to do those things, and those things became necessary because he chose that this is going to happen, if open theists grant that, that God was free to do that, why don't they argue that God was trapped by deciding to do that? I've noticed that they, that they don't, at least not in what I have consumed in content of open theists. And then, of course, there's a bigger problem there, and that is that if the events in the Bible that are spelled out plainly as God predestined such and such to happen, God planned ahead of time for this thing, this event to happen, this person to exist. And God's free to do that because that is his creation and he can do as he likes with his creation. Why is it a problem if God has pre-planned ahead of time all whatsoever shall come to pass? That has not been addressed, as far as I know, by open theism. Now let's look at some scriptural evidence cited by open theists. If uh, one interacts with open theists online, these are likely going to be the two passages that are cited first and foremost. And we're going to start with the first one is 1 Samuel 23. And this is where David is at Kyla. So David is on the run from Saul. He's been on the run from Saul for a while. He is in the city of Kyla. Saul learns about this. And David inquires of the Lord, is Saul going to come down to kill me? And are the men of Kyla going to give me up to Saul? And God says, yes, indeed. Saul will come down and they will hand you over. <clears throat> and the open theist will cite this and say, look, God is showing that this is a possible future. And um, for you to be someone who is reformed, then you would have to think that God is lying to David here. And I think that this is, uh, this is problematic because chapters 15 and 16 push back on this notion, this argument made by the open theist. And that is in chapter 15, 28 of 1 Samuel, Samuel says to Saul, the Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you this day and has given it to a neighbor of yours who is better than you. And then Samuel has to look for a new king at the uh, behest of God. And in chapter 16, verse 12, God says to Samuel, speaking of David, Arise, anoint him, for this is he, meaning David is the one who's going to be king, that God has chosen as king of Israel. Now we come forward again to chapter 23. This is years later. Saul is still ruling over Israel in chapter 23. David has not yet begun to reign. David's survival, then, beyond Kila, is necessary because God already said He's anointed David as king, but David's reign as king has not been actualized yet. So if God said, this is he, but David is not yet king over Israel, in fact, then David's survival beyond Kyla becomes necessary. If an open theist has already granted Acts 4, you know, in addition to uh, what we just talked about here in point number two, if an open theist has already granted that Acts 4 as being God predestined those events, then Christ's incarnation is necessary to happen at the time that it did. And if Christ's incarnation is necessary, that means his lineage is necessary. And we look at the beginning of Matthew and we find that David is in Christ's lineage. And then we must remember Acts 15, 18, that known to God from eternity are all of his works. So it wasn't that God came up with a plan to predestine David to be part of Christ's line later on in David's life. It's known from eternity are all of God's works. 
if it's granted that God predestined Christ and his people and Christians that they would exist from before the foundation of the earth or from the foundation of the earth, then it, it has to be granted that at least from the foundation of the earth, if not before, that Christ's lineage was already known to God. And that means David. And David hasn't given birth, well, not that he could give birth, but he has not fathered Solomon yet. David has to exist beyond Kyla. And then God gives no indication that he does not know with certainty what would happen in his discussion with David in Psalm 23 about Saul's actions and the men of Kyla's action. God doesn't say, well, this is a possible future. He says, this is what will happen. And we read that David leaves Kyla and that Saul gives up his expedition. And then, of course, because David has left Kyla, the men of Kyla do not now then hand David over to Saul. The whole context of David's exchange with God about will Saul come down and will the men give me up is centered on the question of whether or not David remains in Kyla. We can see from reading the context, because David leaves, those things don't occur. If David were to stay, God is saying these things will happen. Okay, then we come to Jeremiah 19, 4 and 5. This is used to counter the concept of God's decree, again, in the Westminster, Westminster Confession of Faith and the 1689 London Baptist Confession. The word decree is in focus here. And so in verse 5, uh, verses 4 and 5, but in verse 5 particularly, um, God says that of Israel that they have built the high places of Baal to burn their sons in the fire as burnt offerings to Baal, which I did not command or decree, nor did it come to my mind. And so an open theist will cite that and say, see, God didn't decree this because of the word decree, and these confessions use the word decree. And so God says he didn't decree, then those confessions must be wrong. Um, but this is a misread of the passage. So we know that at Sinai, God commanded or decreed Israel to offer certain sacrifices. God did not come to Israel at Sinai or anywhere else and command or decree that they should burn their sons as a sacrifice to Baal. Nor did it enter God's mind. Now this is where there's also a misread. Nor did it, what is it that entered God's mind? It did not enter his mind to command or decree that Israel should sacrifice their sons to Baal. That is what did not enter his mind, to command or decree to them to sacrifice their sons to Baal. And when the open theist uses this passage, they'll often say that um, Reformed folks are saying that God is making people sin. And we, we have to remember, we have to have balance here and remember that James 1.13 says, let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. And when an open theist uses this to try to argue that that's what Reformed folks are saying, they're not granting that Reformed folks already accept this passage in James 1. There seems to be some talking past one another between Reformed folks and open theists and not understanding that both sides in general grant the Bible, the whole Bible and its whole context. There's some misunderstandings uh, between how each group or each individuals within each group understand passages of scripture and that's where the disconnect is happening so there's different hermeneutics at issue here all right now we come to the critical flaw of open theism and that's when we have christ on the cross 
in open theism, Christ would be on the cross and would not know with certainty if his sacrifice, if his work, would save anyone. This renders Christ's work possibly completely ineffectual. But we're told in Titus 2.14 that Christ gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession. If that was God's purpose in coming to the cross, then that tells us that God had a definite plan to save people, to re- purify for himself a people for his own possession. Now, open theists will often grant corporate election. In granting corporate election, um, the op- if an open theist affirms that God predestined that w- there would be a group of believers, this makes the corpus ne- necessary, right? There must be a group of believers if God has predestined that there should be a group of believers. But the open theist seems to miss that The corpus can't exist if it is possible that no individuals will comprise it. How can you have a body of believers that that is predestined, but no individuals comprise it? So the predestining of a corporate election requires that individuals become part of the corpus, Individual election is necessary to ensure the necessity of the corpus. So it's already granted that the corpus is a necessity. It's necessary because God predestined that there should be, if this is what the open theist affirms. Then there must be a definite plan for individuals to be part of that corpus. I think that is probably... This is probably the biggest issue with open theism, that Christ is on the cross and does not know with certainty if there will be anyone saved. All right, so that's just my overview and analysis of open theism as I understand it. It was not my goal at any point in this presentation to straw man any open theist position. If this doesn't, if any part of this doesn't apply to you and you're an open theist or you subscribe to dynamic omniscience, none of this was meant to be uh, insulting to you or to be discourteous to you or your position. This is merely, again, to analyze my understanding of the open theist or dynamic omniscience point of view with the major points covered and the major flaws uh, covered as I see them. All right. Oh, and one more thing. I said open theist a lot through uh, through this presentation. It's an easy adjective to use. Um, The term dynamic omniscience doesn't offer itself an easy adjective. The D-O-er, the dynamic omniscient, (laughs) doesn't seem to work. The dynamic omniscient-er. So my apologies uh, there. Um, I was using those terms interchangeably. If uh, one takes issue, The goal there was for the sake of ease of communication and not the confusion of ideas. All right, everybody. Um, What do you think about open theism? Um, Does any of this sound familiar to you? Have you heard any of these ideas? Are there other ideas that you have interacted with open theism? And what is your critique of those ideas? I hope everybody will search out the scriptures to see if the passages that are discussed here are so. And I pray that everybody has a great day in the Lord. See you all later.